Uh, thanks to the organizer for having me here. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Jeffrey Brown. Many of you might know Jeff. Uh, since uh, July 1st, he's the dean of the, of the business school, so he sends his warmest regards. Uh, we might not see him around as often as we used to. Um, so let me just tell you in a nutshell what we do in this paper. Um, so we uh, look at procrastinator, and the way we define you as a procrastinator or an employee as a procrastinator, if you submit your healthcare election on the last day. And then we go on and look in a behavior of procrastinators when it gets to saving for retirement or retirement income decision. And we do find the procrastinator takes longer to join in the 401k plan. They save less conditional on joining. They are more likely to stick with the default option. And when it gets to payout decision, they're more likely to prefer a lump sum to an annuity. Uh, we devote a lot of uh, uh, effort in the paper to uh, square this evidence with uh, uh, present bias preference. That's what we believe is the most likely explanation of our findings. But of course, there are other reasons why people might, might wish to delay their healthcare election. It might be optimal to wait to get, uh, you know, resolve the uncertainty about your health status, for example. It might just be that people are busy or disorganized, they might not get around or the things they have to take care of before enrolling or changing their healthcare status. Or it might be just people know they don't think there is a high cost in waiting. Or people might have liquidity constraint. They might be trying to face this day-to-day -day demand on their uh, time, and so they might suffer this liquidity constraint. So, why do we study procrastination? Procrastination is, uh, has been uh, a subject of psychologists for, uh, for the longest time, and in essence, uh, uh, is believed to be almost a personality trait. I'm overly simplifying here, but the idea is that procrastination is a dimension of conscientiousness, which is one of the big five personality traits. So think of it as almost a, a bit of a stable trait. Uh, from the economics field, I think uh, John has done a very good job in relating and in, in presenting present bias preferences. The leading theory of procrastination emanates from present bias preferences. And the intuition is the following. If we really discount the future way more than we do for the present, every activity that would involve an upfront cost, sign up for, for your 401k or uh, sign up for uh, uh, your healthcare plan, and a delay benefits, then we would think if you, if you are present bias, then waiting tomorrow, the cost would actually be lower. And then, of course, it doesn't unravel because when tomorrow comes, if we are naive, we keep on procrastinating. That would be the mechanism and the intuition. Uh, why do we look at retirement planning? Uh, we all know that there is a, a large autonomy in terms of choices. What we do know less well is that what explains the large distribution uh, on retar uh, retirement wealth when it gets to, uh, you know, when people get to claim their retirement. Uh, and one of the reasons why we all know that defaults are a very effective way of influencing employees' behavior, but what is less known is what actually is the mechanism driving defaults. It might be the case that there be a strong endorsement effect, the employer is suggesting you to save 6%, or it might just be that actually default works because they feed into this bias and they actually uh, I, uh, help people to overcome the bias. Uh, procrastination is, is very likely to be important when it gets to saving for retirement because saving for retirement has two features. First of all, the outcome is very delayed in time. You might save now for benefits that may come in 30 to 40 years, but also people pay attention. People know it's an important decision. And the trick there is that you know, when you're facing an important decision, you know that you need maybe half a day or a full day to think about it. And when are you going to have half a day or full day of time? Of course, tomorrow, not today. So that's the trick of why important decisions actually people may procrastinate more. So uh, that's in a nutshell. So let me show you how do we measure procrastination. We have four uh, different sets of results. I'll be spending less time in terms of you know, uh, the identification part, if you wish, trying to convince you that is indeed present bias preferences. And, and then I will, I will finish uh, with some implication. What do we learn from this empirical exercise? Um, so procrastinators are people that in, uh, they work for a company. They have a 30-day, roughly speaking, window when to change the healthcare election. You might think of going in and changing, for example, your maximum out of pocket or your visual or your dental plan. It's something I've done now that I uh, joined Texas. And uh, then we have, we observe people over uh, between 2002 and 2008 
So we have these seven years of data. And we define you as a procrastinator, we have three empirical measures of procrastination. So if you make a, a, your election, okay, if you make your election on the deadline, the first time you appear in the sample, that's our one measure. Then we look if you were ever a procrastinator in our sample. And of course, the most stringent measure, if every time you made an election, you actually procrastinated. Uh, there is a, we believe there are some obvious advantages of this measure. Uh, first of all, you know, we are measuring procrastination over consequential and actual behavior. So missing the deadline might impose a cost. We are not talking about you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of cost, but it's reasonable to assume from a few hundred to a few thousand dollars cost. Uh, the other thing is that this measure is actually something that can be replicated in other database. And as a robustness check, we actually have data from defined benefits, from defined contribution plan. We also collected data from the University of Illinois, and we replicated out of sample our exercise, finding a similar result. Uh, there is a big challenge. Once I look at someone waiting on the deadline to submit the, um, his or her, her healthcare election form, I might be capturing a lot of things, as I mentioned before. People might wait till the deadline for a series of reasons, and even if they are procrastinator, procrastination is, is, is not the only, present bias preference is not the only reason why people would procrastinate. So we would have to convince you that that's the case. Um, so let me start with the first sets of data. Uh, first part of evidence, we have data from defined contribution plan, 401k. Uh, we have 27 plans, uh, roughly 155,000 participants. And we know when people were hired, uh, we know their healthcare election, the day in the window when they have made their healthcare election. Uh, we also get to see, uh, we have a cross section of data as of January uh, 1st, 2009. We get to observe the contribution rates and the portfolio allocation, how their money are allocated di across different asset classes. In terms of demographic information, we know uh, the gender, the age, the tenure with the firms. And in all our specification, we control for plan indicator and uh, enrollment year indicator. It's a couple variance across plan or across year. Um, we do not know whether the plan offer automatic enrollment or not, but we are going to use uh, reverse engineering, and we are going to use uh, a way of defining plan whether they offer or not for one case, sorry, automatic enrollment by looking at the frequency of people that enroll with the same delay and the frequency of people that invest in the same funds. So uh, first sets of results. Here we look at how long does it take you to join uh, the 401k plan. And what do we find? Those are the three different measures of procrastination. Uh, if you are a procrastinator, it takes you somewhere between 50 uh, to 63 days longer to join your 401k plan. Of course, we do this also using a survival model, Cox proportional hazard model. The second piece of the evidence is what happens then after you go around the delay and you join. And what do we do here is we look at people that were enrolled in 2008. So in the first year, they joined the 401k plan. How much do they save? Again, what do we find is that across the different measure of procrastination, uh, uh, procrastinators tend to save somewhere between uh, 37 to uh, 61 uh, basis point less on an average saving rates of 7.2%. Now, the good news here is that as time goes by, uh, this gap actually gets smaller, gets somewhere after, you know, uh, in our period, we see at most seven years. Uh, for the seven years uh, people, we do find that, that on average, this is somewhere around uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.15 uh, percent. Of course, so here we are lumping together plans that might have automatic enrollment and default option plan that don't. So when we use, once we use our algorithm, then uh, we are able to separate plan with uh, uh, automatic enrollment and plan with no uh, default option automatic enrollment. And it's interesting to show then uh, the effect is concentrated, is stronger, and it's concentrated in plans with no default option. So the implication here, it seems that plans that offer default option automatic enrollment, actually the gap seems to be close between procrastination and non-procrastinator when it gets to saving for retirement. That I think it's a good news. Um, what happens in terms of, uh, you might wonder whether this effect is actually concentrated among people that save very little. 
And so what we do here, we do one-time regression, but basically in a nutshell, we replicate our results for people that are at the bottom of the saving distribution, uh, the bottom 25%, at the median of the distribution, and high in the distribution, the top 75th or the top 95 percentile. To give an idea, at the 90th percentile, people uh, save 12 percent of their annual income or more. And it's interesting to show that actually the effect of procrastination gets bigger as we go up in terms of saving rates. So it seems to be that it's not just people that save very little that are affected by this tendency. We will call these present bias preferences. But the effect seems to be actually uh, constant across the board or actually even increasing for people that have more capacity, more room to save. Uh, something that I didn't mention before is we've done an exercise tried to predict procrastination, and nothing comes in significant. Uh, gender, uh, income, I don't know, income there is a relationship, we'll see it, but uh, uh, gender, age, everything we can observe uh, does not predict procrastination. Seems to be a trait that's across a domain. Um, so, First piece of evidence, uh, waiting longer to join. Second piece of evidence, saving less. Third piece of evidence is how do they allocate money? And here we have another experiment because in our sample period, there was the, imp the implementation of the Pension Protection Act. So the qualified default investment alternatives, uh, life cycle funds were uh, one of these alternatives. So what do we do in a nutshell? We look at the probability of procrastinator to investing in life cycle funds before the Pension Protection Act and after the Pension Protection Act. We do this in a difference in different setting. And what do we find as expected is that procrastinators are way more likely to invest in life cycle funds after the Pension Protection Act, somewhere between 10.8 and almost 12 percentage points higher likelihood. Um, and the same goes with uh, the probability of allocating 100% of your funds in a, in a, in a life cycle fund. Uh, the second database gets to the question of what happens when people uh, retire. And so now we are using data from defined benefits plan uh, that all offer the option to choose between an annuity and a lump sum as you retire. Uh, we have data from uh, 63 different firms, over 27,000 individual. Uh, sample period is still 2002, 2008. Pretty much we do observe uh, the same covariates. Uh, so what do we find here? is that if you are a procrastinator, uh, you are less likely to choose the annuity, more likely to choose the lump sum, uh, somewhere between uh, 5.9 and, and 4 percentage points less likely. And in our sample, just to give an idea, 42% of people actually uh, choose the annuity. Um, so after we saw these results, then we start thinking, OK, is this really present bias preference? Is there a way we can think about it? And we thought of the work that uh, Jeff and I have done looking at the framing, meaning how retirement benefits are presented. And we happen to have in our sample a bit of a, a natural experiment, I should say. And the idea is that uh, we have cash balance plan and the traditional defined benefits plan. And uh, what happens there is that our hypothesis is that in cash balance plan, the lump sum is made more salient. All the information you receive on your account is based on the balance. In a traditional defined benefits plan, you would receive information most likely based on your replacement income or retirement income. And so we do compare cash balance to defined benefits plan. And what do we find interesting is that uh, the effect, procrastinators are way less likely to prefer the annuity, more likely to prefer the lump sum uh, in cash balance plan, where the retirement wealth is presented as a lump sum, uh, less so in the fine benefits plan. And it's very interesting, actually. And again, uh, this is we are trying to think broadly in terms of policy implications. So maybe I wouldn't overinterpret this in, in an academic setting. But I think it's interesting. If you look at the major of those who procrastinate always, so we have only less than 2% of people in our sample that every time they make the health care election, they do it on the deadline. Uh, these people have a very large uh, there is a very large effect of preferring the lump sum over the annuity if they are enrolled in cash balance plan, but actually it reverses in the fine benefits plan. So there is something we have to think. I'll return back on this when, when I get to the implication of the conclusion. Uh, so how do we interpret this evidence? Uh, so we have seen that if you are a procrastinator, you join later, you save less, 
you are more likely to go with the default asset allocation. And when it gets to retirement, you prefer the lump sum over the annuity. So what do we do in the paper is we start thinking, OK, are people that we classify as procrastinators people that optimally wait to submit the healthcare election? And we do observe in our sample, uh, this is an, an electronic enrollment. So we have timestamps for every time you log in in the system, every time you submit an, an election. So it might be that in the 30 days period, you submit your election first, and then later on, you have resubmitted it. And so we define as procrastinator only people that log in into the system once on the deadline, and they pull the trigger. We do define as optimal delayer instead people that they might submit still on the deadline, but they have submitted something else before. And indeed, once we look at optimal delayers, they have the opposite behavior. Uh, they join sooner, they save more, they are less likely to stick with the default. So this is kind of hinting that is not optimal uh, delay that is driving uh, the, uh, the results. Uh, are just procrastinator busy or disorganized? Being busy or disorganized might explain why you wait longer to join. But once you join, there is no clear implication why you should save less or you should prefer a lump sum. Uh, rational and attention, we don't think is the case. Our back of the envelope uh, calculation estimate uh, the cost of, for procrastinator of all this uh, misbehavior around 10 to 15% of retirement wealth. So it's a pretty substantial cost. It's difficult to make the argument that people are rationally foregoing 10 to 15% of their wealth. We look also at liquidity constraint, and we do control for financial education, for measure of liquidity constraint, uh, for income quartiles. And the effect of procrastination is constant across income quartiles. Uh, so we do repeat the exercise, the exercise at the University of Illinois data. We do find, again, same, the procrastinators are less likely to join supplementary retirement saving plan. So what are the implications here? I think there is a good news when it gets to saving for retirement. And the good news is that if we have default option, actually default option seems to be working and seems to be helping the people that need them the most. And we do find this interest that, uh, interesting results that there is no gap in saving rates between procrastinator and non-procrastinator once we have automatic enrollment. And overcoming procrastination can actually help people to increase the retirement savings somewhere between 10 and 15%. And I think this might be a lower bound what, given what Jonas said, because if people change a lot of times job and they cash out their benefits, then that this number is, is likely to go up uh, substantially. Uh, the not so good news is when it gets to retirement income and annuitization, because we do find that people that have self-control problem or present bias preference are actually more likely to prefer the lump sum when it gets to retirement. And guess what? The effect is larger when the, the lump sum is made more salient, which is the, the working frame we have in 401k plans where you always see your retirement wealth uh, that's very salient and evident to you. Uh, and so I would conclude to say there are good news and bad news. And thanks for your time.